the gentleman on my left, uh, your right, is the most incredible human being that I know. Somebody that I really value and love. Uh, this is John Lowen, my beautiful spouse. John is a clinical social worker and has worked with forensics, the most awful people you can imagine, uh, and somehow has managed to not only maintain his humanity and his love, but he has really, I think, embodied the spirit and the love of true parents. His testimony has so inspired me of his work with true father and true mother. And the two of us coming together, uh, hopefully will represent something really special to you. And uh, we hope we can do honor to their lives and also to the experiences that we have had and have been privileged to make. Well, let me introduce you to this amazing woman who I refer to as my queen, but more significantly, my Messiah. See, this is the dance between man and woman is really powerful. And this is a powerful woman and father uh, recognized that, you know, a lot of people were, were so in awe of true parents that they, they cease to be human because they're, they're so high up there. And, and a lot of people, I joke about it, but it's a serious point. You know, they're just so serious and bowing to true parents. When I ask them, so what can you tell me? What do you really know most about true parents, about father? They would say father's shoes, because that's the position they were in most of the time, looking down at his feet. But uh, I would say Sandra and father and mother were like friends. They, they, they really got to know each other. So uh, I'm hoping Sandra can talk a little bit about her journey with people that she loved and loved her, and they they really had a real relationship. So maybe you gonna share some of that? I will. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I have always really felt bad for second generation, third generation, because I remember father and mother coming to Argentina when John and I were there in 2005, and we were so excited. They're going to get to meet the true parents. These are people that had never seen true parents other than a picture. And one woman said to me afterward, one young woman, I said to her, so were you excited? What was it like for you? And she said, they're so old. And I thought, no, you didn't get it. And then of course I had to realize that for most of you, when you became cognizant of the meaning of our movement and the significance of our movement, true father was dead and true mother was that tall. On the video. Because screen. you only saw her on the video or you saw her in some crowded auditorium and she was that tall. Whereas for those of us who came to the movement early, we saw true parents really had skin touch with them. So I joined the movement in 1966, which was, sometime before some of your mothers and fathers were born, uh, which gave me a kind of a special status. I think we had about 45 people in the United States. I got a little card somewhere that actually says I'm member number 45. And uh, I was privileged to be with a lot of the, well, with all four of the main Korean missionaries, which gave me some special perks. One of the things that happened for me early on was, uh, some of you may know Jun Ri, the, the karate master the, at, who brought really martial arts to the US. He was our member at one time and he hosted a program for the Little Angels, the little girls dancing group that uh, performed for President Eisenhower and Queen Elizabeth and many people like that. So I go to dinner expecting just to have dinner and I wind up sitting next to a woman that I will identify as Mrs. Lee. Mrs. Lee decided to make a confession to me. She talked about her relationship with True Mother. You see, we didn't know very much about True Mother at that time. And as many of you are probably aware, when you said True Parents, the people at that time thought true father, and that's the way they conducted things. So true parents 
are going to do this or that. But when you went there, there was true father and true mother was sitting in the audience. So that was all we knew. And I was curious about true mother. So I'm talking to this woman and she starts to tell me a story. She said, at the time, back in 1960, when I was 14, uh, she was going to be one of the candidates, this Mrs. Lee, for who would be blessed to true parent, who to true father. And so she went into a big room, as uh, your parents will tell you they did later. And there was some selection interview process and so on. And finally, true mother was chosen as the person to whom true father was to be blessed. Well, this Mrs. Lee was outraged because you see, she had gone to the biggest university, uh, AY University in Korea. She had graduated, she had skills, she was beautiful. She had money in her family. Uh, she had personality. She had everything it took to be in her estimation, the perfect bride of the universe. And she couldn't understand it. And neither could a bunch of other women who found themselves in exactly that same position, being educated, smart, beautiful, wealthy, uh, very public minded. So they went to father afterward and they said, father, you chose this little girl. You know, here we are, we know how to perfume ourselves and how to quaff ourselves and how to make ourselves beautiful. She's this little thing, she's got no makeup on, she's wearing two little braids like a little kid just out of high school. And uh, she works in the kitchen scrubbing pots. How could you take on a person like that as your bride? Who is she and what is it that makes her so special? What has she got that we don't have? And of course, father looked at her, raised one eyebrow and said, what has she got that you don't have? She has the love of her true husband. But later Mrs. Lee said, she started to have second thoughts about the task of being the wife, the bride of the Messiah, because she got to witness true mother's early life. And I've looked through the book. I haven't seen this anywhere, but this is what she told me. In Korea, if you think of that time, the lifestyle for a woman was very different from what it would be now. And certainly what it would be in the United States or some other country, uh, just coming out of the war, they had a lot of the old traditions as far as the roles of men and women. So the woman was considered nothing. She was just the wife of the man, whoever he was. And she was expected to cook, to clean, to have the babies, to wait on the man hand and foot, to be there at every moment. If he stayed out late, she was expected to be there with the food ready and everything piping hot and in preparation. So true mother after the blessing became pregnant immediately. But here she is now, large with child, sitting in her room, which was off to another place, and uh, waiting for True Father to come home. Now, this would be something if True Father was coming home at five or six. It would really be difficult for a woman to keep the food hot and keep a smile on her face if he was coming home at seven or eight. But True Father would have meetings as he planned how to help the world. And these meetings would go sometime until one, two, three in the morning. And she couldn't go to sleep. She couldn't lie down. She couldn't do anything. She was expected to wait for him, no matter how long this took. And this Mrs. Lee said, you know, I couldn't do that. I don't know who could do that, to wait alone. Often she was alone. And this is something that we missed. 
a woman, particularly a pregnant woman, did not present herself in the society. She stayed by herself because that was considered not done to show yourself, especially in front of other men. So she would have to stay in their little room, hearing him, blah, 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 with these men. And somebody would say, okay, thank you. I go home now. And she'd be, yes. And then the person would, okay, so, so, and so I've been wanting to talk to you, father, for so, and blah, blah, blah. So they'd go on and on and on. And she would have to wait and wait and wait. And then father would come upstairs and he's exhausted. And having all of his food and everything ready, he could fall into bed and say, I don't want to eat now. So this Mrs. Lee said, you know, you're thinking about all of these things. That was not a pleasant way to live. It was not a happy course for her. The other women not only didn't comfort her, they were actually rather mean to her. Because when they would look at her, they would think I could do things better, or they had more family support, or they had something else. But this woman was pretty much all alone. She didn't have buddies that she could call up on the telephone and go, this man is driving me crazy. I just don't know what to do with him. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, she couldn't do that. She couldn't text. She couldn't watch movies to occupy her time while she waited. She just had to wait on father's whim. So now comes the time, and this Mrs. Lee, Mrs. Uh, Lee said, you know, I feel bad about it, but I didn't feel bad about it then. We were just relieved. So what happened after that was, of course, uh, true parents came to America. We learned very little about mother up to that time. Uh, now you walk into a room and here's a picture of true father and true mother, or you have one in your bedroom or you have one hanging wherever, I don't know. Uh, but you had these pictures. Whereas in our time, we didn't really see true mother. We had no idea what she looked like. When true father came in 1965, he came by himself to America. So now he was coming in 1969 and he was going to bring true mother with him. At that time, women in Korea were selling their hair for the movement. We didn't have money. We really didn't have money at all as a movement. So people would actually grow their hair out, the ladies, and they wouldn't put perms or waves or anything like that. And then at some point they cut it off and they would sell it to a vendor. And that's how they made money for the movement, however they could. Some people gave blood, some people did whatever, but the women sold their hair. So when True Mother came in her little Korean dress, she wore this bun on the back of her head that was just an artificial hair thing because she had sold all of her hair at that, pro at that uh, point, you know, the, so that it was clipped very close. And uh, she had done that and they continued to grow their hair out. They'd let it grow and then they would cut it off and sell it to ladies who could afford to buy it. So I know there are a couple of you out there going, this could have been true mother's hair. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was the way that she and other women made their money. And she wasn't spared because she was the wife of true father. In fact, it was expected that she would go first in setting the example for the other women. One of her jobs was, of course, having children. Uh, it was understood that she was going to have as many children as possible representing the kingdom of heaven, the 12 gates. And so she was, when she came to America for the first time, very pregnant. And it was not an easy pregnancy. She was struggling with that. And she spent a lot of time in her room, again, Father's having meetings with all of us. So I could walk into a room where True Father was sitting and just sit down, plunk. And if there was a Korean there, because I still know 11 words of Korean, I learned one since the last time I talked. Uh, you know, I could sit down and I could talk to Father. I could ask him questions, all of that. 
this was just available to us. But for poor True Mother, she's in a room away from True Father because she needed to get her rest. And she's just going uh, on her own. People would occasionally bring her something to eat or whatever, and we might see her at mealtime. But mostly she was uh, trying to uh, bring forth this pregnancy that she had. In, and I, I'm tempted to throw in some things about True Father and just the experience we had, and that, that could happen. I'm going to talk about some things later, though, I think. Uh, this was her course, and she understood it to be precisely that. So the one time that she addressed us at the very end, after we had been talked to by Mr. Kuboki, who was the leader of Japan, and uh, Ms., uh, uh Jung Wee Kim, who was the leader in Korea and all of these great leaders and they spoke to us on a frequent basis. Uh, the next person we spoke to at the very end was True Mother. And she spoke in apology. She said, I'm so sorry. I envisioned coming and being able to go witnessing with you and to be able to interact with you. But none of that happened because I'm pregnant. And therefore I need to uh, be just kind of flat out on my back and take care of myself. But I pray for each one of you every day. And uh, that was one of her jobs as well, was to pray for every member. And I'm sure she didn't hit us all, but I think she hit all of us sometime, but really to support us and to, to love us through prayer because even that she could offer. So True Mother goes to the airport with True Father and uh, Mrs. Luan Pak Che and all of the other people that were traveling with Father and his entourage. And all of us go together and we're all excited to see True Father and True Mother. So as they are leaving, I had had such an experience with them uh, that I wanted to do something just to show how grateful I was. I had had a few gifts that I gave True Mother. I think I gave her a pair of fluffy uh, uh, slippers and a nightie or something. It was just stuff that I thought would make her happy. But now she's leaving. And I felt all of this gratitude to True Father and True Mother. I knew I couldn't hug True Father. But I looked at True Mother. She's leaving. And I couldn't help it. I ran up to her and I threw my arms around her and I hugged her goodbye. The whole movement was shocked. I couldn't have gotten a worse reaction if I had hit her over the head. They were just like, what did you do? <laughs> I don't know, I just felt all this love. And they're like, how dare you touch true mother, you evil person? Oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? And so I, of course, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> no. Uh, so I remember this event, okay? Uh, so I, I, I was withdrew <clears throat> and went back to my humble place of being just an ordinary member. We were, of course, doing a lot of things and we we're watching America change and develop. When this event happened, of course, uh, we were very modest. Uh, a lot of our members had been staunch Christians, including me, but I wasn't from that branch. So uh, they would do things like they had associations with colors. You never wore red and black because those were evil colors. Satan's colors. Satan's colors. And I didn't know what to do with my high school black blanket because we had uh, red and black were our colors, so I hid it. I think I left it at my parents' house. And uh, you never wore sleeveless clothes because that was exposing too much of yourself. And you never, ever wore pants. Uh, if you were a woman, not, not men. If you were a woman, you never, ever wore pants. So, and I, had, I lost spiritual children because they would come to the center wearing those kinds of clothes and they'd basically get kicked out. And I didn't know how to deal with this at all. And I'm asking God, give me a way to deal with this because my brothers and sisters are driving me crazy. So father and mother are coming back and uh, I'm allowed to go to the airport. 
I'm allowed to go to the airport if I stand in the back, even though now I've, I'm, an, I'm an older member. But I'm being, because they don't know what I'll do. And what they don't want me to do is to grab True Mother and hug her again, because that would be just horrible. So True Father comes down and he's shaking everyone's hand. True Mother comes down and she's shaking everyone's hand. And everybody's looking at me like, don't you dare. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, okay, hand, hand. This is, this is it. This is what I do. And uh, True Mother gets to me. She looks at me. She throws her arms around me and she gives me a big <laughs> hug. And the whole movement's like, what? <laughs> And uh, she doesn't hug anybody else. <laughs> so I'm kind of sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't call me spiteful. Uh, anyway, uh, she remembered that. And of course, people are trying to kind of rationalize it. Like, well, maybe she thinks that's the way Black people act. You know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm like, no, she did it because I hugged her first and she remembered and you know, whatever was going through her head, that was a pleasant and positive experience. And I'm glad I could do it. And that she could respond so beautifully to me. Plus we get back and instead of being in her Korean outfit as she was in 1969, where she wore Korean, Korean, Korean the whole time, mother takes off her coat and she is wearing a black and red sleeveless pantsuit. Yes, Sandra got through. So uh, the next day, all of these people that were so, oh, don't wear that kind of clothes came down in their, in their slacks. And I'm like, where did you hide those? How did you get them so quickly? Uh, but it was a change. And we came to understand that our concepts, our past concepts were not what true parents were all about. They were about iconoclasm, breaking up the old traditions and helping us to do the same. So got to put in a little note here about True Father. Uh, there were a lot of issues with the fact that Americans were different from Asians. Father wanted us to work hard. And he gave some speeches for a while where he talked about how, you know, Satan is up early in the morning, so we should be up in the early in the morning. I was feeling like, well, if Satan's up early in the morning, he'd be tired by the time I got up. But that's just the way I was thinking, okay? Uh, anyway, so Father eventually stopped talking like that. And he said, I wanna see if you Americans can stay up 24 hours a day. And so he talked with mother, mother talked with him and he came down, he was giving us talks. He was lecturing us on some divine principle that I have not heard in uh, people that were not in those lectures at those times. He was talking particularly about, you know, the creation, the deeper aspects of the fall, uh, who Jesus really was, Jesus's life circumstances, all of these things we were hearing from him. And he would give these talks and he'd end hmm, nine-ish. And he would say, well, I know you Americans need to go to work, but mother and I, it was Christmas time. Mother and I were thinking of going down to see the peace pageant. And we'd go, you know, would you like to go with us? And we're like, sure. You know, so we'd go down, look at the peace pageant, get up on stage after everybody was gone, sing songs and come down. And then you get home and it's like 1230. Oh my goodness, I got work in the morning. I got to go to bed. Next night, father comes down and he says, uh, well, I know you guys are really having kind of a difficult time because you had to go to work and you must've been tired. But mother and I were thinking of going out for some ice cream. Would you like to come? And so we're thinking, well, ice cream, how long could that take? Sure, we'll go. You get there and now it's like one, two o'clock in the morning and you're dragging into bed. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I don't care what this guy says. Next time he says something like this, I am going to bed because you had that option. You could go to bed, nobody went to bed, uh, but I was going to bed. 
And so father says, okay, it's the third night. I've kept you guys up so late. But mother and I wanted to teach you a new game called Ute. Uh, if you'd like to learn it, come on downstairs and I'll teach you how to play Ute. And I said, absolutely not. I am going to bed. So I went upstairs and I brushed my little teeth and I flossed and did all the things that I did. Put my hair up in rollers and climbed into my sleeping bag because we all slept in sleeping bags in those days. That was our bed. Uh, Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. We could do that. And so anyway, uh, I'm in bed and I'm rolling over, getting ready for my first really deep sleep. And I hear this, yay! <sighs> You, 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 you. Back toe, back toe, back toe, back toe. Ah, oh, darn. I got to go see what they're doing. So I go downstairs. I take the rollers out. And I'm not going to stay. I'm going down there. I get to the door. Father sees me come in. Remember, we're in small spaces. We're not in auditoriums. He sees me come in. And he goes, oh, oh. So I come over, he puts me on his team and it's like the whole youth spirit world descended on me and I've got really good at you. And so I'm on father's team and he is excited. And I'm excited and we're all yelling and, you know, everything is really cool. Our neighbors hated us, by the way. And we're, our, everything is really cool. And mother's hanging in there with us. And she was on the team with me and father was on the team with me and I was in heaven. And then somebody looked out the window and went, oh, my Lord, that's the sun. We had stayed up for 24 hours and I don't know how many cups of coffee I drank at work the next day. But we kept staying up and staying up and realizing that we could go beyond our limits. It was just a question of what we chose to do ourselves. And I'll say that one at one point in my life, I decided to stay up for, to see how long I could stay up. I stayed up for three days and I was at Universal Studios and I fell off my chair and fell asleep and <laughs> lying on the ground. So it was uh, quite a challenge to know what can I do? What are my limits? And we don't know what our limits are until we actually challenge them. So you don't have to stay up. Please don't stay up for three days. But it was really kind of an interesting point for me to have that wonderful opportunity to be more with true parents than we had been before. Mother, I believe, again, was pregnant and we were traveling. We were going places. We were doing things with them. And she was hanging in there for the schedule. I was amazed at her stamina because it was not mine. Uh, we went on the first Day of Hope tour, which was in 1972. And it meant that often true parents were uh, traveling with us. They slept with us. And father had said, mother and I really would like to stay in your houses. But of course, Later on, we found that we were putting them in hotels because we couldn't understand that kind of idea. But at the time, they were living upstairs from us. And uh, we were 70 people crowded into a maybe four bedroom house. <clears throat> and having the experience of seeing them every single day as I said, True Mother was not at the fore at that point. True Father was the one who was teaching us. He taught us how to teach divine principle. There were 70 people that he personally taught. Only a few of us are around or actually teaching at this point. But uh, he really, yes. Were you one of those 70? I was oh. one of those 70. And uh, when Father did the tests and everything, he said, I was the best. Well, I could so, so, so anyway, <laughs> I enjoyed having that experience and, and, and dealing with that. And a lot of things. Uh, my, my husband here keeps telling me I should write the book. I'm working on it. 
because I have stories about true father, I have stories about true mother, and some of those stories keep wanting to look, kind of leak in so that you can hear them, but uh, I'll move on. We went to, uh, first we went to um, Alice Tully Hall, which was the first place that we performed. At that time, uh, our true parents' father, he was out in front. True mother was usually in the audience. And he would, so she was not sitting on stage. And, and he would give these talks. We learned a lot during that time as father who had never been heard of uh, by the American public was exposed for the first time where people could know who he was and who true mother was. So. Their first poster said the day of hope, the day of the true family. And there was a picture of course of Injunim and Jojunim on there as little tiny kids. And the two of them were so beautiful in that poster. Uh, I know it's here in a box somewhere, but uh, it was a very special time for us to see them as a couple. And it was really the first evidence we had of couple in 1969 the first American couples were blessed. Uh, most of them were scattered across the US. So we didn't get really to observe them because uh, I think all of them went out somewhere. Uh, my phone is trying to, can you just shut the sure. phone? Sure. Okay. It's trying to tell me things I don't wanna know. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just a situation where we were interested in the blessing, this exciting blessing that had been given and watching true father and true mother in their blessing garb, which made them look very different from their ordinary street clothes. And we, we were dazzled and amazed by them sometimes because there was so much going on spiritually. So we then, uh, some of you may know, I write music, and I had written some of the early church songs and one I wrote for True Mother, but I never got it. It never became popular. It was a song called The Queen of Heaven. And it just talked about the two of them standing together as husband and wife and being the bridge over which the whole world could come. And I could feel that for them. There was so much power in their relationship, so much excitement. So you wonder how in the world did your parents go through so much stuff, uh, however they wound up. And it was because they actually could feel that power and could hear those words coming directly from the source. And it made a big difference for them. In night and for us, in 1973, uh, the end of the year, actually, 1972, uh, they moved to Belvedere. And this was a move for them to live in the United States uh, in the beautiful Belvedere property. I think most of you are in New York or, so, or around in that area. So you've been to Belvedere. And they, they lived in the main house and uh, the women lived in the Agora house and the men lived in what used to be known as the chicken coop. It has the name of the training center because they got the chickens out. And I don't know where the chickens went. I don't want to think about it. Uh, we ate a lot of chicken back in those days. Uh, but we went, to, we went to stay at Belvedere and that became our training center. We of course wanted to see more of True Mother, but you know, kind of she wasn't speaking then. We would see her at events with True Father but always very uh, close and of course, always very pregnant. And it was becoming more and more difficult for her. In fact, when she had her eighth child, it was recommended, gee, maybe you don't need to have any more children. But she went on and she had more, more children because that was her providential uh, destiny and she did fulfill that. Uh, in 1976, Father spoke at Yankee Stadium. The thing about Yankee Stadium, if you've heard, oh, that was a testing ground and blah, 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 blah. You had to be there. I was there. It was scary. 
uh, yeah, there was a guy climbing over the fence with a high powered rifle. Yes, there were people in doing strange things in the auditor in the uh, stadiums. Uh, it was pouring rain. All kinds of things were happening. I was in performing arts, uh, singing in the rock band by then. I, before that, I had sung in the choir and now I had moved on to the rock band. And uh, we, I walked by True Mother where she was sitting and I could see on her face the concern, the worry uh, as she sat there with her children in the stadium, not on stage, wondering what was going to happen. And that bond of prayer and hope that she was experiencing, is this going to work? Am I going to have a husband when I go home? Uh, was more than a lot of us would like to ever have to go through. Well, I went through something in my life that I, I call closed karma. I had an issue with my wardrobe. And that main issue was that it was always disappearing. So I went to work one day and I came home. There had been a terrible thunderstorm and I had clothes in my closet when I left home, but because there was this terrible thunderstorm and several women had come to uh, hear the divine principle lectures, the lecturer had said, oh, well, just go up to Sandra's room and get some clothes. And they did, and they didn't leave their wet clothes behind, which did not work well for me. So I opened my closet and I had two outfits and they were the two that I really didn't wear often. These women had good taste and I had no clothes. Uh, so that was an issue. Once I put on my shoes and my foot just went right through the shoe and I put on another pair and they fell apart as I was walking in them. So there was something strange about clothing with me. This happened several times to me. I would send my clothes, put my clothes under the bus and they would disappear. And I was not fancily dressed. I mean, I had ordinary clothes, but I had some kind of clothes karma. And this apparently came to true parents attention. So I got a call one day to go to East Garden and meet with father and mother. I got there and I'm the only person there with them in a very homey situation. They're sitting at home uh, having their lunch and uh, father is giving me these little bits of food to eat. You know, like, hey, you know, this beef is so good. I was a vegetarian. Uh, you know, I want you to enjoy it. Just, just chew it. And the issue I was having wasn't just that I was a vegetarian, but I had just had major, I had had a, a wisdom tooth removed the day before and it had been cut out of my mouth and I had been in a lot of pain. And you know, I'm like, no, I'm not supposed to eat for 48 hours, but you can't really refuse. So I was eating there. And I was enjoying, I was enjoying this food. I was really enjoying it. My mouth wasn't hurting. Nothing was going on. And right in the middle of our meal, this incredible snowstorm started up. It was really bad. And so father said to mother, why don't you take Sandra out and buy her some clothes? I'm like, what? <laughs> Because there's nobody there. There's father, there's mother, there's uh, Unjanim who had come home early from school. Yejanim had come home early from school, but she had gone up to do her homework because she was that kind of girl. And uh, there was Peter Kim who was doing our translating. So father says, mother, you go and you take Unjanim because she speaks uh, English and she knows Sandra and likes Sandra and go buy Sandra a wardrobe. So I go shopping with True Mother. We went to White Plains and uh, we, she shopped. And she went from being quiet, gentle, sweet mother to, you got that in blue. I know you've got it in blue. She needs blue. Where is it? <laughs> and people are like, oh yes, oh yes. And they're running here and they're running there. Uh, we're at Macy's and you know, uh, I'm watching her and I'm going, where's this been? <laughs> we had no idea 
that, or I had no idea that mother was like this, that she <clears throat> had this commanding thing, you know, she was. And so she says to me, so what do you want, what do you want to buy? And I said, well, pretty clothes, mother, I don't know, no. So she picked out a wardrobe for me and I'm looking at this wardrobe and I'm like, yeah, these clothes are, you know, they're, they're, they were not my style. But actually when I put them on, I looked pretty good. You know, I'd like to think I looked good anyway, but I, I looked really good in these clothes that she had picked out. And she was very commanding is what I want to say. So uh, as I'm leaving, of course, she gives me some money to take home. I'm loaded down with packages. Uh, I'm at the Irvington train station. We don't know if a train's coming or not because there's like snow and it's coming down. But she says, oh, the train will come. So I said, okay. And I got out of the car and I said to her, thank you so much, mother, for taking me on this beautiful shopping trip. I am so excited. I've got some wonderful clothes here. And, you know, just thank you so much. And I had to do it. And it was worth doing. I threw my arms around her and gave her yet another hug. And she hugged me back. And she said, you're welcome. And off I went with my true mother wardrobe, which was all the clothes I had because my clothes had disappeared again. So it was a thing. And I was very happy to have this experience with her. Uh, of going shopping because it did show me something very meaningful about her and a different side and a compelling side of her that was so strong. Now I'm going to mention this because I considered it kind of an odd thing at the time and I don't know why it happened. And it took me back to Star Trek. Like I was, I don't know. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, but in 1996, my husband and I were selected to be national messiahs to the Republic of Argentina. And True Father was in um, Uruguay and he said he wanted all of the national messiahs to be in their country by the next, I, I think it was within 21 days or something. So through a series of what I'm going to call miracles, I wind up in Uruguay. And it's a competition uh, where they're having a, a singing contest. So when I got there, of course, they blew the contest off, but they paid my way down and paid my way back. So that was a good thing. And uh, because I was going to compete. So I, I did this competition uh, that wasn't a competition. And I went backstage after performing. And at that moment, father and mother came through. And mother was very happy to see me as usual. She always was. And uh, so the two of them said, oh, Sandy. And they're the only, there are three people in the world that can call me Sandy. And uh, one of them is in the spirit world now, true father. And uh, of course, true mother can call me whatever she wants. And uh, my husband doesn't call me Sandy. Well, no, you don't like it. Right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but from them, I take it. So anyway, uh, she, they come backstage and it's like, oh, Sandy, your, your voice, your, your singing is so, makes me so happy. Uh, what happened? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so I said, well, I'm very happy. Now, now I'm wondering like, how did I sound before? But uh, so I said, oh, I'm very happy now. And it was like, you know, father bowed, nodded and left. Mother nodded. And as mother nodded, and as I went to give her a bow, a bow, we clunked heads. And it shouldn't have been a very big clunk, but it was like, bam, it echoed all through my body. And I think my life changed. It was as if I was carrying some aspect that I had gotten from her that was like a protection or a love or a something. And I felt it so strongly, still feel it today, uh, that something very special transpired between the two of us. You know, it was like I was carrying her essence or, or something. And I felt that so strongly. And it, of course, affected the way I thought about my life after that and what I wanted to do with myself. So the last time I saw a mother close up, was in uh, 2005. 
Uh, she had come to Argentina where I was living uh, in 1999 and had given a talk there. But then, uh, you know, she, she had a meeting with us afterward, but mostly uh, she was on a time schedule because she was touring countries. And so she didn't get a chance to really speak with us personally, but I did at least get to, to see her up close. In 1999, uh, the a true father and true mother came to Argentina. I'm sorry, in uh, 2005, a true father and true mother came to Argentina and uh, spoke to the group. We had a nice little uh, meeting with them and it was all very official, very formal, and but enjoyable in its own way just to see them and to recognize how they were doing and what was happening with them and to sit in the same room with them as we had so long ago which brought back so many memories. The ultimate experience I had with father and mother was in 2012, actually April of 2012, just before father went to Korea uh, where he would of course ascend. And at that time, uh, we were sitting way out in a tent somewhere uh, on the property in, at Las, Tru Vegas. in Las yeah. Vegas, yes. And we were sitting way out in a tent somewhere. And somehow things wound up that we're leaning against father's chair. Uh, and he's sitting there, my husband's leaning against the arm of father's chair. And I'm sitting next to my husband very much in, in the view of two parents. And uh, of course they're acknowledging us and we're acknowledging them. And we're just, we're just feeling very close to them. And, uh, Father actually spoke to John, and maybe he'll say something about that. I don't know if I leave him any time. <laughs> Take your time, baby. You, you get the goods. And uh, then uh, it was the experience of learning that they were uh, going to go to Korea, and Father was, uh, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen, that or we didn't expect what was going to happen, that Father was not going to return and that True Mother was going to uh, become the head of our movement eventually with all that was going on. So we're always in the position of waiting for the experience of, for the next experience with True Parents. And uh, I do have to share this one because it deals with uh, what happened um, on September 3rd. All right. So it's it's a true father experience. I said I, those were going to leak in, so I can't help myself. Um, we had heard, of course, that true father was ill and that true mother was at his side and that there was this anxiety. I had noticed true mother giving real attention to father. Uh, he had come at one point and she was just kind of, you know, straightening his collar and making sure, I, I'm gonna touch the sacred head here, you know, make it, sorry dude, I, don't, I just messed it up. That's and funny. making sure that his hair was straight and everything was all right, you know, and just attending him in that way uh, as his wife, as his mother, as all of the roles that a, a wife has. And, uh, of course, you've heard the testimony that he asked her on the last day of their lives to sit across from him rather than next to him so that he could look at her and have the experience of seeing her. Well, our movement was doing prayer conditions and you know all kinds of you know fasting and worrying about him. But on September 3rd, uh, John and I had gone to the home of a couple we had blessed and we were actually sitting on the dock outside their house in New York, when uh, in upstate New York. They lived on a lake. They lived on a lake. So they were, <clears throat> we were sitting on the dock at the lake. And uh, I look up and I see this, this flock of butterflies, it looked like. And then they got closer and I realized they were dragonflies scarlet dragonflies, bright red dragonflies, and they're flying toward us. And they fly over us and around us and they're surrounding 
uh, uh, my friend Lori, who was blessed, uh, Lori and me, and uh, then all of the butterfly, all of the dragonflies except one flew away. Now I'm not a bug person, I don't do bugs, but this one bug came and it sat on my hand. Yeah. And it sat on my hand and it walked over my hand very gently. And then it, I turned my hand over and it walked on the inside of my hand. And it stayed there for a moment and then it took off. It went across the, the lake, across the lake near the surface. And suddenly this big, beautiful silverfish came up, ate it, and went back down. Swallowed it. Just, and took, and went back down. And all of the other butterf- all of the other scarlet dragonflies went away. And at that moment, I knew True Father not only had passed away, but he had come to say goodbye to me. And, excuse me, that was a really special moment for me. I wandered into the house and I lay down for three hours and I was dead. I was really worried. I thought, I didn't know if you were sleeping or had you, I, it, it, so the queen went into a no zone. Yeah, I'm usually very easy to wake up, but I was just out. It was like I was in coma for three hours. And uh, then I woke up and we packed up and we went back to go back to Albany where we were living. And at that time we learned that True Father had ascended to the spirit world. And I was totally knocked out, but I was more knocked out when I asked someone about these scarlet dragonflies. And they said, there are no scarlet dragonflies on the East Coast. You'd have to go 3000 miles away to find them. So the only thing that confirmed what had happened to me was the other woman who was there because she saw it. She saw it happen. And she was the only other way that it was known that this had actually happened to me. So of course, my concerns, my prayers went to True Mother at that time because she was going to walk a very difficult path there. And to walk that path alone with 2 million children, 5 million children, how many ever, however many there are of us with her, looking to her, uh, asking her, you know, wondering what she's doing, how is she going to keep this together? Very critical because she's a woman uh, and an Asian woman and what does she know and how much you know, she may be the Reverend Dr. Moon, but how much education does she really have? And what does she know about dynamics and, you know, things like that. All of that came into play for her. And we cannot see the negative, the negativity that gets directed toward her. But we certainly can feel this woman who, despite everything, insists on carrying out the work that God gave for her husband to do. And in that respect, you know, she has the ultimate task and needs the ultimate support. So that's all I have to say about it. Well, I know Ilya, he sent us a message that we're, you know, we're gonna wind down. I wanna take two minutes just to, cause I know this woman very well and she's got a very real relationship with God. You know, a lot of us not even sure if we believe in God or what we think or feel. But I think behind the depths of what uh, Sandra shared is a, a very simple person in the realm of the heart. Because in the realm of the heart, things are simple and they're complicated. They're not complicated. Our minds are very complicated. We can argue about theology and what it means. So I just want to plant this seed in, in everybody's mind. The answer to all the questions are on the realm of the heart. And uh, I went through a period when I first matched to Sandra. I was intimidated. This is such a spiritual woman, and people can be intimidated by mother and father. 
but in the realm of the heart, we're all the same. It's just love. And whatever greatness we feel from other people, don't project it onto others. Don't be listening to, oh, this is amazing what Sandra, the experience Sandra had on Sandra had. Your destiny is to have an even more amazing experience because it's going to be your experience in the realm of heart. Sandra just had the wisdom from the blessing of her ancestors and other things to know, let's not get complicated. Let's be present. Sandra was present in the realm of art. So she received that. You, 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 there's, it's not even about the greatness about, of true parents. What it is about receiving what God is trying to give you through true parents, but not just through true parents, through each other. So uh, you don't have to go my course being intimidated by, by a great woman or even true mother or true father. Get your blessing. And we'll talk more about that in your questions. Uh, the most important message is you are important. Uh, and, and what makes us important is we have the ability to receive the highest love. So the important thing is receive it. Okay. How's that for me being brief, baby? I usually, I'm stunned. I, I usually, you know, for those who know me, it's like I, I just get warmed up and clear my throat after the second hour, and then then I get to the point I'm making. But you inspired me, sweetheart. Oh, wow. Okay, well. So I have a couple brief ones. I remember at the time we were blessed going through, and... Uh, I've had a lot of issues in my life with men that were just so treacherous. We're comfortable lying with each other. So I, I wanted, when we went through and we were getting the holy water and all of that, I really wanted to get it from mother. I was praying that when we go through, I, I, I want to go through uh, getting it from mother. And I remember a big piece of water going right in my eye. I'm looking up at her and she, and she smiled. She says, yeah, I heard your prayer. <laughs> so that was one. Yeah, uh, th th there was another one, too, that um, I, I uh, you know, just I, I had a brutal relationship with my mother. My mother went through some terrible things herself. She was disowned by her family for leaving the Jewish faith. So they actually held a funeral for her. So you know, my mother was bipolar and she was depressed out of her mind at times. So I was really looking for that feminine side. So a lot of time was father was speaking when Sandra talked about mother being in the audience. I would look back. I wanted to see what's up, you know, hey, somebody's watching you. Hello. Right. And, and, and she got that. And, and, and she would say, like, you know, look at father. I said, and, and I remember being not defiant as a bad boy, but just saying, yeah, I know you want me to look at him, but I want to look at you deal with it and, you know she was I wouldn't say she blushed but uh I was a bit of a character and uh she acknowledged that and she knew that and the other one was uh father in the late 70s early 80s was talking about home church all the time every Sunday father was talking about home church but in the beginning people didn't get it father talked about it for like six months before really caught people really caught on so I remember in the very beginning F father was saying something and uh, I remember I just, I would interrupt father in, in a, uh, sometimes he was talking, I would blurt out answers. And I remember saying, well, home church, if we really do it, that, that's how we're going to solve that problem. And mo mother said, yeah, that's right. So I got anointed uh, through her from that. And uh, you know, that, that's with me every day because you know, I'm still doing home church. Great question. Very great. Honest question. question, real question. Oh, now we're excited. Because we had that connection, and I don't mm -hmm. pretend that I understand everything that True Mother does. You know, you have friends that do things, and you go, why'd they do that? But they're still your friends. And uh, I feel that way. Um, it's, there are providential things that we don't understand. And there are also uh, questions that we may have. And I think if we look at them, the question is not so much, if I'm understanding your question, uh, 
what is what is going on and why those things are happening, but what is my attitude when those occurrences occur? How does it affect my relationship if we have a difference of opinion? I don't know, Jen. Well, I'm not, I can't answer for you. Well, <laughs> answer for you. What do All you right. Think? Well, th- these are my kinds of questions because you know, some of us are, are blessed with uh, things working out well for us and we're happy and it's all well. And I just wasn't one of those. My life, I was blessed with crises, right? Which I didn't realize was a blessing till much later because those of us who have crises, and this isn't a crisis, whoever asked this question, but, but it's, first of all, it takes courage to ask this question. And, and number two, It speaks to the fact that whatever the church has officially said is not enough. And it's not supposed to be. We're supposed to generate our own. So um, I I would say this is a great opportunity for you to own the fact that God is looking for you to have something deeper than your generic uh, paint by the number, follow the yellow brick road uh, relationship with God. So. so, so for me, you know, mother is a gateway. I mean, there, there, we exist in two realms. You know, the divine principle talks about origin, division, union. So we exist in a vertical context, which is connecting to God, and we exist in the horizontal context. Sandra was sharing a unique journey of her horizontal journey with mother in the actual physical world, right? But also mother represents something. Mother represents the, 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 the early stages of the feminine side of God finding a home on this earth, right? So another way of looking at it is what's your relationship to the feminine side of God? Or, or let's put, put it another way. Father talked about there being four personalities on uh, basic personality types that reflect the seasons. So he's talking about a summer personality, winter, uh, spring, and autumn. And two of those, winter and summer, are would represent what Carl Jung talked about in personality types as thinking and feeling, right? So, So the feeling is more the feminine side of God. I mean, let's look at Ilya and Diane as an awesome couple. Got a lot of questions. I know. I, I, my, my wife, she, she's wanted me to be responsible, which I'm not. <laughs> okay, in the traditional way. So, so you want to, you want to, you're thinking about something. Uh, go, go talk to Ilya because he's thought about it already. I'll give you good odds. You're feeling something. Talk to his queen. She feels very deeply. So, I would say, don't, don't worry about. Uh, just your relationship in a pragmatic sense to mother, what's your relationship to your feeling side? Because as you go deeper in that journey, the the other question will uh, uh, answer itself because mother is here to open us up to the feeling side of life. She's not just speaking theologically. She feels something when she sees people starving all over the world, right? So I would encourage you, rather than worrying about it, cultivate your feeling side and and help get in touch with that and uh, take it from there. Hopefully that's helpful for you. Thank you. And I I, I look at my wife. She she was feeling, she was saying, John, there's maybe some other people's questions won't get answered. We got to think of everybody. She's feeling that. (laughs) And I'm thinking, I got one person who's interested. If I can, if I can touch that one person, that's all that matters. Because I'm so the feminine side of God cares about everybody. The masculine side cares about one individual at a time and wants to make sure you've discovered the diamond buried in the garden of your soul. So whoever that individual was, yeah, I'm willing to put the whole group on hold because you are that important. I would say, and I'm going to leave this one to John too, I'm the feeling person. Uh, The way that it's been explained is, uh, to my sense, it would be the person that that is loved by God, who's selected by God for a very special mission. So uh, 
I think we have tended to put some very uh, otherworldly <laughs> kind of uh, ideas with that. But really, it means being called by God for a special thing to do. Uh, true mother is a human being. And uh, the, we don't want to make the same mistakes that uh, traditional Christians have made with Jesus, where we deify and people are suddenly walking off the ground by 10 feet. All of us are meant to be the, the begotten sons and daughters of God. All of us are meant to be unique and absolute and unchanging uh, and e eternal as God is. So to call mother the begotten one, I would say she is the first begotten one because God's been trying to beget some women for a long time. And we've made it a little hard for God sometimes as women. So she's going that path of pioneering a path for every woman in the world to be a very special woman to God. And it's up to us to take up that path and to, or to take up that task and to go forward with it. Give me a little something there, baby. Boom. Yes. Uh, you know, whoever asked this question, you know, the phrase begotten, I, I think the reason that, you know, there's controversy, you know, when someone proclaims, I am, you know, when, when uh, Ali, Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest, everyone wanted to kill him. But then he went out and showed that he was. So mother stated, I am the only begotten daughter. That was true when, in terms of her journey, but she's not the only begotten daughter anymore. Thank God, because we have other daughters who've been inspired and, and put their stick out there and caught the, fly, uh, caught the fire. Diane's also, as Sandra said, a begotten daughter of God. And what about Unni? She looks like a begotten daughter of God to me as well. I know this one is because I know what she's done for me. She couldn't have done it unless she had what, the, what God had in her. So I just feel that we need to look at addictions, okay? Not all addictions are crack and cocaine and, and uh, uh, sex, food, and all the uh, work. Some addiction, humanity's greatest addiction is running from our destiny, avoiding our greatness. How many people have been addicted to avoiding looking at their greatness? I know I wasted half of my life doing this until this begotten queen said, hey, John, stop telling me about all your heroes, how great Bob Dylan is and Malcolm X is and this one. Why don't you look at yourself? You're pretty great yourself. It's hard because as soon as you stand up and stretch your stuff, now. Nah, Someone's going to take a shot at you just for, for the brothers out here in sports. As soon as you win the Super Bowl, next year, guess what? Everybody's gunning for you. So our brother Yasu, right? Are you a great man or are you just a, a follower of a great man? I see a great man. So let's all deal with our addictions together. And then we won't have to worry about mother be it, being the only begotten daughter because that won't be relevant anymore. You know, the Bible talks about at the end of time uh, uh, that God's dwelling place is with man. He has come down, right? So great question. And, and uh, so whoever asked that, uh, please dig even deeper and not just have great questions, which this is, become the great man or woman that you are that could ask bold questions. Well, I think rather than feeling, I feel distant from true parents, I don't feel like I can relate to them or whatever. First of all is to realize this is not a sign that God hates you and you're going to hell. Uh, second thing to realize is that we don't sit around all the time thinking about true parents. Uh, John makes a reference a lot to the fact that true parents are pointing in a direction and we are worshiping the finger that is pointing. And that's not the goal. 
The best way to feel closer to true parents is to do what true parents direct us to do and to follow that word and to follow that direction. So we all know what it is that we're meant to do. We all know how to live our lives. We all know that uh, every day is not going to be a day when we are in the presence of true parents. I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, you know, they were saying, why don't I feel true parents? Or, or when I pray to God, why don't I feel God? And I said, you know, if your prayers are the same every time, God up and he goes, oh, here's Sandra Lowen. Okay, I know what she's going to say. Put her on put her on voicemail, send her to voicemail and uh, I'll pick her message up. If I hear something urgent, I'll deal with it. Uh, now nah, it's the same old stuff. Uh, bless the world, bless God, so on. So sometimes what it means is that we ourselves just need to get over feeling like I've got to feel something for true parents and realize that I've got to enlarge myself. I've got to feel my life is, is working for God. I've got to do things that are good in my life and what I know need to be done. And God will find you. Oh, I like that last line. God will find you, you know, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I would put it like this. First of all, I came from an atheist background where, where God was just for weak people who couldn't handle dealing with death and, and, and were too shallow to think deeply. So I, I've altered that perspective, but it wasn't totally wrong because there, uh, Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the people. So there, there's, a, there's a shadow side to religion as well, that uh, are you feeling distant from true parents or are you feeling distant from people telling you about true parents? Uh, and and they're, talking, they're talking to you without connecting with you. And, and because, you know, religions, you know, people have been inspired by Moses, by Jesus, by mother and father and true parents, but that doesn't mean they know how to pass it on, inspire other people. You know, so I, I remember one of the great rabbis who I, I, I met people who met him and, and people would come to him and say, I, I don't, I'm sick of this religion. I'm sick of God, uh, you know, and all this. And this. I, he, he's a, it's all stupid to me. I don't believe in God, right? And these are kids, people like yourself who were born into the Hasidic movement, just like you were born into the church. And, and the rabbi said, so what are you talking? What don't you believe in? I don't believe in someone telling me what to do. And he says, well, I don't believe in that God either. Okay. So who are the true parents that you feel distant from? Are they the ones that resemble some elders that you are bored with? You know, uh, are, do they resemble your parents that you, you maybe also feel distant from? Not blaming your parents, but, but you know, it, it's about ownership. And, and, and let's look at how Father started this movement. Father got a calling from Jesus. Guess what the first thing he said when Jesus said, I need you to help me. He said, no. No. Right? And he said, <laughs> and then, then, then Jesus, came, Jesus came back and said, you know, I, I really need you because because X, Y, and Z. And then Father said, come on, man. There's, this is not an exact quote. I wasn't there. But uh, he said, there's got to be people more prepared than me. I'm some Korean kid, you know, you know. there's got to be people better. You must have, there must be better people who are more prepared. He says, yeah, they are. There are, but they all said no. You're the last one. You're the last one. So, so Father was a deep guy, and, and the fact that you feel some distance means you're deep. You're not going to just accept any answer. You should feel close to two parents because they lived their life and sacrificed for you. Apparently, that answer ain't getting it done for you. Should you be ashamed? No, be proud. Because you're walking in the footsteps of some young moon. After he discovered the divine principle, he goes to Father to present it. And God tests him. God says, this is garbage. You're not going to save the world. I'm, I'm so disappointed in you. He's being tested. So Father goes back. His mind is spinning. He's looked looks through the whole thing, trying to figure out where, where he got it wrong. And he, he can't find anything wrong. He brings the divine principle back a second time and says, 
I, I know you said this is garbage, but uh, th this is, I I'd like you to bless this. And then God really goes off and says, you disgust me. Get out of my face. Don't, don't, don't call me until you get it right. So father's head is really spinning now. He goes back home, goes over everything. And then he comes the third time and he says, before I was asking you for your blessing, but I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, this is some young moon, not me. I'm telling you, this is the truth with which I will save the world with or without your help. So whoever asked this question, I want you to consider the possibility that you have a calling. You're not supposed to just be following true parents. You're supposed to become a true parent and show the world something. You got something. That's what I'm suspecting. That you're not satisfied means that might not be a problem. That might be a calling. Just a thought. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Uncle John and Aunt Sandra for answering that question. I really loved your answer. And I feel like like towards the end, how you said, like what Aunt Sandra said, like God will come to you. And then also Uncle John, what you mentioned uh, it made me think of like so many times in our movement, we kind of like banish asking questions in a way, kind of like, oh, if you ask too many questions, then you're not faithful enough. Or like, if you ask too many questions then you must be doubting. But I feel like in my own life, like, like you shared by asking questions, I actually developed my faith with true parents. So for whomever asked that question, I really believe what uncle John and Sandra said, like, but when you focus on your own life of faith and really uh, deep in your relationship with God, then you automatically, or it, it gets like, you, you find your path and it's easier to connect also with true parents because you found that light within your, your, yourself. Uh, elaborating here that, um, you know, all of this comes down to ownership, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, you, you're, you're living in a house, you say, welcome to my house, but it's really not your house. The bank owns it. You're paying a mortgage. Mm, yeah, but 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 we, we we like to feel something. So, until your heart is satisfied and you have all your questions answered, you're not an owner. You are a follower. You're mm. renting someone else's mind. Mm. So, uh, I, I think it's beautiful because questions are a sign that we want. It's a, it's a, my father was a teacher. He loved good questions. So all you guys with questions, you should give triple points to the people who ask the, the, the kinds of questions that most people would be nervous asking because they're pioneering the ways. They're the elders here who are saying, it's okay. God wants us to, to have the answers in our heart and our mind, the questions in our heart and mind answered. And, you know, mother's talking about the heavenly parent, holy community. The heavenly parent community can only be holy when all questions are welcomed. So mm -hmm. thank you, brother or sister, for uh, taking us in that direction of really creating a holy community. Many. <laughs> uh, we both are clinical therapists, for one thing. And I'm also a uh, K-12 and college professor. And... Uh, have a bunch of other jobs, you know, I, I, I can do all kinds of stuff. I can knuckle count. I've delivered babies. It's cool. Uh, so yes, there've been many, many life changing moments and places where I felt God's inspiration in the instant. So job wise, I go to work with God. I mean, I just feel like God is there already and God occupies that place where God is always looking for the opportunity to wake us up, to call us to attention, to welcome us, uh, and to inspire us to do something great for the sake of someone else. So my question to God is always, you know, I used to wake up and I do it still. I'd wake up and go, okay, God, what are we doing today? And, uh, I stopped asking God what he wanted me to do because it was just like overwhelming. I just said, okay, so what are we gonna get, get done today? Are we unpacking boxes? Are we uh, greeting the neighbors? Are we helping somebody out? And taking whatever our inspiration is to the other people I think is a part of God in our lives, I don't know. And um, 
being able to do that, I could see, you know, father talking about just the smallest thing that he had, uh, that he would get inspiration from, a piece of dust that he talked about uh, what made us sane or not science sane. Uh, if you're talking to yourself, because that happens nowadays, we don't know the difference. People have earphones and we think they're insane. But, uh, you know, the, if you're talking just on the street to yourself, everybody says you're crazy. If you picked up a piece of dust and started talking to it, oh, it's all right now. So going into work, the difference between having God there and the difference between not having God there is that without God there, we are victims of whatever is going to happen. With God there, we've got our best friend at work. And I don't know if that answers your question or not. I'm going to turn it over to John because he's always got the answer, right? <laughs> Well, I got a answer. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I got a bunch of stories because uh, I never had the experience of fitting in. So I was always generating conflict wherever I went. Uh, there was a great, <laughs> what's true? There's I was a, his boss's <laughs> boss. I know that that statement is true. Yeah. There's a great <laughs> song. I'm showing my age from the Grateful Dead. Uh, uh, it's called St. Stephen. And what the, the opening lyrics are St. Stephen with a rose in and out of the garden. He goes, one thing always remains the same wherever he goes, the people all complain. So, so uh, that's been my journey. So yeah, I, I had a lot of really beautiful experiences where in essence, I learned that conflict it's not really conflict. It's seeming conflict. In, in order to not get killed or not to stay in a state of permanent conflict, you have to learn to see things from more than one position. So my wife and I, we have conflict all the time, but we don't use it as justification to, uh, to destroy each other. I just say, look, buddy, Mr. Deep Man, I guess you got to go a little deeper so this woman feels understood. Oh, oh, okay. And, and, and w when I have the experience that she feels understood, like, oh my God, look out. The power of a woman who loves you and feels understood, scary and the most wonderful, beautiful, sublime. Oh, best drug on the planet. I'm just telling you. But I, I will add this in a, in a theoretical context. We talk about the blessing. My mother's, talk, mother's talking about wanting to bless one third of the world. We're talking about billions of people. And trust me, she's not satisfied with one third. She's saying, I want to bless the whole world. But uh, yeah, I know that's too scary to say that. So I'll just say one third. Okay. So, but really we're talking about the, the original three blessings that God gave to all humanity. First blessing to be fruitful. Second blessing to multiply. That's what we're talking about here. And the third blessing, that's related to work. So you need to bring your victory in the second blessing to your job. Because most people don't, don't when you're blessed, you have access to the deepest secrets of the world. If you make them your own, I look in my boss's eyes or I look in the president's eyes or the most powerful man on the planet's eyes. And I say, what you got? You ain't got what I got. So, so work is, is a metaphor for the third blessing. So we need to bring a vi our victory to our work. Most of us don't have a victory yet. Ilya and Diane are a huge exception for young people. That they're not just, uh, not answering questions. Well, we're just following. We're holding on. We're doing great. No, they're, they're, something's going on there, as we, for those who are watching, could see. And they bring that to the work environment. And interesting things happen. So just like the, the brother who said, I, I don't know how, to, how I feel about true mother or true parents. A lot of it is we don't know how we feel about the blessing because the blessing is the second blessing. You got to deal with the first blessing, which is really, who are you? So God had something very specific in mind when you were created. You, you weren't an accident. Mr. and Mrs. God didn't get drunk and oops, they got pregnant and you were born. Don't forget. No, I'm, I'm using good language here. I'm not. No, you're good. Go okay. So you had to be born. 
God didn't concern herself or himself whether you're, with whether your parents were ready. Most likely, they were not. So you got to sort that out before you get to the other thing, right? So we're talking about work. That's the third blessing. Well, we start with the first blessing. What's the purpose of the first blessing? To get to the second blessing. What's the purpose of the second blessing? You guessed it to get to the third blessing. So when I go to work, I, I change the, my world. The world around me changes when I show up because I got something from the second blessing and the first blessing. I wanted to just put in a, a comment about CDPC. Okay. All right, go ahead. CDPC was a, that's the Capital District Psychiatric Center. And my husband and I worked there at the same time on the same unit. And we therefore took over, why not? And uh, <laughs> Even though we weren't the, the head of the unit, we just co-opted the lady that was and got her to, you know, she really got into God and Drew Barrett's and a lot of other things. We connected on the feeling side. Yeah. We felt what people needed. and We didn't have to ask, do you need this? We just provided it. Right. People showed it. Right. And we totally changed the atmosphere there. Most people, we were not allowed to say that we were married, even though we have the same last name. But that's another story. Uh, but we were able to really change things. Uh, the company did not want us to even work on the same unit because they thought we might get divorced. That was their big fear. Because that, that's the norm. That's the norm, that they had had other couples there before and they'd gotten divorced and it caused a big problem. But finally, we became a part of the orientation and they were saying, hey, you've got to go down to uh, unit A and you've got to see, uh, they've got a couple down there. They are phenomenal. We never said, well, I can't say we never said a word about true parents because we did. Uh, John had us doing prayer conditions and talked about father and mother a lot. And but, people but, but just went with it. But not in terms of just uh, the official propaganda of the church. I explained it in ways that were relevant to other people, you know, that you didn't get what you, we did. None of us got what we needed from our parents. So let, let's yeah. deal with that. So as I said, you know, earlier, God will come to you. I said in, in answering another question, there was a time at which John and I uh, left the company and 10 people showed up at our house of our uh, co-workers because they wanted to be blessed. We didn't invite them. They just showed up and uh, took us to their families and to their families. So we were able to do lots of things, not because we were putting that propaganda out there, but because we were trying to manifest it in our lives. And that was yeah. that. So, so real simple for, for those who study nature, you know, I said before, the purpose of the first blessing is to get to the second, and the purpose of the second to get to the third. So let's look at an apple tree. The purpose of the apple tree is to create what? People are going to say apples, but that's only part of it. Create apples that can create, that have seeds that can create trees. So the purpose of the apple tree is to create more apple trees. That's a multiplication. It's true from the lowest to the highest. Yeah. So what's the purpose of true parents? To create children? True children? Part of it. But it's to create more true parents. So I like... I, 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 I wouldn't mind being a kid born to Ilya and, and Diane. I might have liked that better than the parents I was born with. But hey, you got to deal with that. So, um, you know, let, let's not make true parents uh, a weight that weighs us down. They are a bridge we cross over to become our true selves. And that will inspire people. Talking about true parents ain't saved the world yet. Nobody's interested. Being true parents, irresistible.